Hold down. Hold silent. Going, going, going. Go on, so congratulations. Welcome to the Current Market Insights Podcast, brought to you by Harris Partners Real Estate. Each episode, we chat with real estate author and industry leader, Peter O'Malley, to discuss the current property market conditions and provide insights to assist you on your property journey. Welcome to Current Market Insights Podcast, back for another week in the studio with my good friend, Peter O'Malley. Peter, how are you? Oh, really well, Kieran. Great to see you. Always great to see you, my friend. Peter, we've spoken recently about the RBA. Well, I say recently, we talk about the RBA all the time. They're kind of like our second friends here at the Current Market Insights Are Podcast. They? Someone should have told me. Kieran. Well, you know, I, I get the newsletter because I'm interested, you know. We talked about the RBA at length. We've talked about their pretty aggressive, or I would consider relatively aggressive monetary policy over the last 16 months or so. You know, their aim to, to try and curb spending, bring back inflation, get the market in check, and as you've so eloquently put it so many times, execute something of a soft landing. Given the scenario we're in, cash rate currently sitting at 4.1%, uh, and savings rates, therefore, being higher, I wonder... Has that changed the investment market in terms of where value for money really lies for for investors right now? Investors are already in the market, are enjoying higher rental returns, Kieran. It must be said that they're also experiencing higher costs. So different landlords would have different net scenarios. Land tax is a massive impediment for investors in the current market, and that's investors that are considering buying an investment property, and most importantly, those that already own one and get one of those nasty invoices each year, and they seem to only ever get bigger. So yes, whilst mortgage rates have gone up and rents have gone up, we've actually seen investor inquiry go down. So moving tangentially, I guess, Let's look at interest rates more broadly. If I'm an investor and I've got, you know, a term deposit returning me say five, five and a half percent at the moment, does it make sense for me to put my money into an investment property if if there's an opportunity to snap one up at, at a yield that's probably going to be less than I can get on cash at the moment? We're not seeing any speculative buying investors hunting opportunities in the market in recent times. You remember when we uh, we had Mike Silvatsis in with us last week, and Mike was talking about uh, mortgagee and possessions achieving full market price. So even when there's a distressed seller, it doesn't go for a distressed price because the market is supported by buyer demand at the moment. Now, if we see, uh, for example, a sharp increase in mortgagee in possession and a sharp decrease in buyer demand, then there might be some opportunistic buying on the horizon where you see bargain hunters or vulture funds or vulture buyers coming into play. But if you're talking a straight out mum and dad investor who just want a long-term investment that'll do well for them uh, over the foreseeable future, they are not evident in the market at the moment. They have no confidence that interest rates have peaked, even though obviously we're getting close to that. But the sharp interest rates uh, increasing cycle has rattled um, mum and dad investors. And uh, to be frank, they're uh, they're battling with the day-to-day cost of living. There's definitely not too many households with surplus funds out there who uh, will go out and buy an investment property. Governments, in their wisdom, and I, when I say governments, I mean all forms of government, have um, put costs and taxes up on property investors and put impost as far as regulation on landlords goes. So what we've done here is the property market, landlords that are in the property market have found their costs have gone up at the same time that it's uh, it's becoming harder to get a full commercial return. And there's a big discussion going on in society at the moment about rental caps. And rental caps have been trialled around the world and certain states in Australia are pushing forward with rental caps. The unintended consequences of rental caps will be disastrous. But uh, for all of those reasons that we've just discussed, investors are staying on the sideline and choosing, if they do have monies to invest, to leave it in a term deposit risk-free, as you say, or try other asset classes, hence the resilience of the stock market. 
Would it be fair to say that uh, you know the only potential investors that are coming in now are those that are willing to, I guess, sit their money on the premise of capital growth into the future, as opposed to getting some kind of income return, you know, in six or twelve months, you know, that they may get out of something like a term deposit without the the increasing costs behind that. Uh, look, that's a part of it, but I find that the investors that are buying at the moment are either self managed super fund investors or people that uh, intend on living in the subject property but are going to rent it out for somewhere between one and four years whilst the mortgage is at its highest and make that debt tax deductible. Now, I'll let others decide whether that is or is not a good strategy, but the reality is is that we've seen a lot of people buy properties in the last 12 months who ultimately intend on living in the property but are going to rent it out early in their ownership to take advantage of any tax benefits they can. I'm glad you mentioned uh, self-managed super funds there, Peter. Very contentious point. Obviously, the uh, the federal labor government have talked about changes to super uh, and changes to the taxation associated with the, the amount of money that's kept in super. Do you think that... Uh, that's going to have a negative impact on investment prices, given that you know there is a, a very serious risk that people are, who are trying to buy property as a retirement, I guess, safety net, are then punished for doing so. Uh, one of the terrible legacies of COVID is the rich have got richer and the mainstream have fallen further behind. And anything that governments do at the moment to make property investing less desirable will ultimately hurt those that need to lease an investment property far more than those that have the money because those that have the money, if property investment doesn't make sense, they'll go and find an alternate asset to invest in. Property is not the only thing that you can invest in. But if you need to live in a property, you need to live in a property. And if you're competing against an increasing number of tenants each Saturday to find a property, clearly the price is going to go higher. The rental market at the moment is a bit of a hiatus over this uh, winter period that it's had, uh, where stock levels been a little bit high. But as we head towards summer now over the Christmas New Year period, I think you'll see rents will start to uh, increase again. No doubt. No doubt, Peter. Look, uh, other than you know something traditional like, say, net yield for an investor who's looking at a property, uh, are there any other elements or, I guess, property classes that, that may still have some kind of appeal in this market when, as you say, the share market's performing well, cash rate's quite high, so people are getting good returns on, on money that carries zero risk effectively? Are there any classes, you know, commercial or industrial or other areas that may make sense for an investor? Well, in the, in the residential sector, looking for undercapitalized properties is a really smart play at the moment. So I've seen some really run down close to unlivable homes on good sized blocks sell across the inner west in the last six months. But because building costs are so high and you know laborers and, and builders are so difficult to source, people have shunned those type of properties, Kieran. But I, I think they represent medium term opportunity. So well, I can think of a few properties uh, that have sold that were the people who ended up buying them will do very, very well once this whole inflationary outbreak is is behind us because they bought really good location, um, severely undercapitalized site with immense upside. You may or may not be following through the financial pressure when it comes to commercial real estate, that it's under real pressure, work from home, what the internet allows people to do away from the office is for real and it's permanent. It's not going away. You're seeing office towers with the uh, you know the big uh, the big funds being downgraded and revalued now and valuations being written off by the tens of millions essentially because those corporations can't get the same rental return for those office towers. You only need to go down your local suburban shopping strip to see that retail is under pressure, both internet shopping and uh, dominant retailers like your Woolworths and your Coles have sucked the life out of the small retailer. So a suburb only needs so many coffee shops. Um, <laughs> Tell that to Barrel of the Southern Highlands, Pete. Uh, well, that's probably one place where retail might go, well, I was in Barrel at the start of the year and uh, I thought I was in Bondi on Boxing Day. That that place was absolutely heaving. Um, so you know, there's I've, I've there's been, a coffee shop on every corner, though. I've been in Kiama where that's experienced the same. But, of course, that's, uh, that's not necessarily the case seven days a week, but certainly big crowds there. But uh, by and large, the local suburban... 
a retail strip is is under pressure, and that's probably not a great investment either. Sadly, we're seeing a lot of uh, business done straight from the warehouse to the to the doorstep. So therefore, industrial is is the hot sector in terms of, or the hottest sector of the commercial markets at the moment. And if you can get a good retailer to take a long-term lease from you, and um, they've got a good uh, online presence, that'll do really well. I did note that Amazon were considering leaving their Sydney warehouse, uh, industrial warehouse, because of the cost of real estate, industrial real estate in Sydney. So even that might be reaching a maximum point. So there's no doubt that um, commercial real estate from an investor's perspective is not in vogue at the moment. Everything cycles, but that might be a deep downward cycle for the commercial sector. You mentioned uh, just before that there you've seen examples of or, or potentially maybe a small trend towards uh, those who are purchasing a property with intent to move in later on. Do you think that this kind of market encourages things like rent vesting where, where someone might purchase, effectively be able to write off or, or reduce their liability on a, an investment property, but go and rent somewhere else just to, to weather the storm until times improve? Oh, that's definitely in play at the moment. That's a, a smart a smart move in, in many instances. Okay. And for people who are doing that, you know, looking at their, their kind of mortgage structure, does it make sense in those scenarios to sort of go an interest only option or are they better off still trying to push down on some of their principal at the same time? Oh, I think they're best off trying to get the principal down always. Paying the loan off has always been my personal mantra, not servicing the loan. But uh, different people will have a different theory on that. But uh, I think if we could all achieve one thing in life, it would be to have the primary residence unencumbered, debt-free. You want debt against performing assets, not against your home, so that um, you can sleep easier at night. Wouldn't that be nice, Pete? Look, as we uh, as we wrap up for today, I, like always, would love your thoughts on where you see the kind of investment landscape evolving over the next 12 months. You know, if if all the stars align and we, we execute this great soft landing and the market recovers really well or it comes to a, to a point of stability, should we see an increase or, or how do you think it's going to play out? I don't believe there'll be a bounce driven by investors at any stage in the next 12 months. I don't think, and I don't think investors will take serious interest on in mass in residential property in Australia until state governments settle down on this rent cap and all landlords are bad people mantra that's that's flowing through. Now, what's difficult politically for those state governments is they don't necessarily agree with that either, but you have fringe parties in different states that are agitating and driving that and that's their platform. And, that's, and, and even um, Anthony Albanese is uh, struggling on the federal stage with the Greens on this very point. So it's highly, highly politicised at the moment. And uh, I think it's really short-sighted for any political party to target landlords. The uh, whole landlord-tenant equation is a classic seesaw. What is good for the tenant is bad for the landlord. And what is good for the landlord is bad for the tenant. So we need balanced policy there. And, you know, just I'll give you one unintended consequence if a rent cap comes in. Landlords, not because they're bad people, but because there's only so much money to go around, will pull back on maintenance if they're hit with a rent cap and they can't exercise full market rent for their property. Because at the end of the day, they've got to pay increasing land tax, increasing council rates, increasing strata rates in many cases, increasing maintenance costs, increasing management costs. But then they're told, no, no, you can't get full market rent for your property. Oh, and increasing mortgage rates. And if, you know, as you say, the, the sentiment out there is so negative that if they even considered ra- you know raising rents, then they're the bad guy, you know, most certainly. Uh, I find it, you know, to me, it's a little bit ironic that Albanese's future housing fund is very much looking to be some long time in the future, given that they cannot get any agreement on policy in the federal parliament. Well, at the time of recording, he's threatened a double dissolution on it, so he knows what's at stake. If if Anthony Albanese is prepared to go to that degree on that topic, um, I don't think there's any other topic that he would go, any other policy or issue that he would go to a double dissolution on. That'll show you how serious the and acute the issue is in Australia. And um, he's, he's right to make it a primary issue. Absolutely right, because you can't invite 400,000 extra people into the country every year and, and only build 50,000 new dwellings. When you're talking about 2.5 people per dwelling, 400,000 additional people each year is a lot of people coming into the country. 
absolutely. And yeah, as you say, building de- you know building supply that only covers roughly a third of those people is is woefully inefficient. So Anthony Albanese might think that he he's on a winner on that issue, and and those that uh, you know I didn't realise that there were so many people, Kieran, that are genuinely sleeping in tents and cars out there across Australia. I I must confess that at first I thought it was a media beat up. And the more I ask around from people that I know in regional Australia and and uh, around around the place, is there are families that uh, you know living in caravans, um, moving around, just you know making use of public facilities to get by until they can uh, get themselves into housing. It's 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 a serious issue out there, and um, thankfully um, the federal government know that, and they they're trying to do something affirmative to fix it. Yeah, well, look, hopefully they can. Uh they can get the country you know, back on track in that respect because it's certainly not the Australia that, that I knew growing up and, and I'm sure many people you know, have, have had a very different experience and hopefully we can uh, bring it back on track. Well, if you grew up playing cricket in the backyard and now you're um, you know, sleeping in a wagon of sorts in your car and showering at the local surf club, which is what I've heard is common enough, uh, up and down the Queensland coast, for example, that's, uh, that's a stark uh, difference between your childhood and your adulthood. It's a sad state of affairs indeed. Peter, look, that's all the time we got for today. As always, I really want to thank you for coming and, uh, and talking about what I think is a really important topic. Indeed. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for joining us on the Current Market Insights podcast, brought to you by Harris Partners Real Estate, the podcast providing real estate insights you won't find anywhere else. <laughs>